Exactly, sir. Um, yes, uh, can talk to you about everything. Um, so, by way of introduction, my name's Rob. Um, I am um, Australian, uh, so um, I don't know. People people love the accent, so but let me know if it's not working or I'm talking too fast. Um, I've been working at Clara for a bit over a year, um, working on OpenZFS. Uh, the 20 years prior to that, I was a Linux sysadmin. Um, so I've mostly been allowed in the door by installing a FreeBSD uh, computer. I have one, and uh, you know that that's that's the cover charge. Um, but I am kind of a groupie. I do hang around all the FreeBSD people, and uh, they um, they've, they've been very kind to me. So, uh, but I'll I'll try and get my commit bit in due time, and then I'll be official. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about some work that I've been doing over the last year and a half um, uh, in ZFS uh, around the F-Sync uh, system call and all the machinery under that. Uh, so, but I will start by talking to you about how we do files, just a bit of a refresher about how to write files. So I'm not going to show a lot of code. I'm going to show some code, but I'll explain it. So this is... Um, let's imagine we're writing a, some kind of file upload service. Um, clients upload, connect to us, they upload whole files. Um, you know, they just blast objects at us, we save them. Um, there's no editing, there's no that sort of thing. So it's just a very simple storage service. We could call it something cool. We call it like triple S or 3S or something like that. Um, and this is your basic structure for something like this, if you wrote it in C. Just getting a quizzical look here. We all right? Good. Um, rotate. Oh, I see what you mean. Cool. I'll I'll figure that out. All good. Um, I'm just getting instructions on how to use the microphone. Uh, so, yeah, this is the basic structure. How am I doing? Oh, it's on my screen. So we start off by. Um, We've got this, we've got a file descriptor, and you know, we want to take whatever's coming in on it and we want to save it to this file. So we open the file with some flags and we sit in a loop. We read some stuff out of the file into a buffer, and then we write it to FD, which is our, our file, and we spin on it until we're done. Um, and don't think too hard about my, uh, my error checking and my partial write handling. I wrote that on the train. I haven't compiled it. I haven't looked at it. I tried. You should try. But this is not good code. Um, but anyway, then we finish writing the whole file in. So we call fsync. Um, and fsync is us saying, I need you to ensure that this is on the disk, everything I've written. Because normally you write, and it goes into like a memory cache. And sometime later, the operating system will, you know, when it's good and ready, will write it down to disk. But if sync is saying, I really want this on disk, do it now and tell me how you went. Um, and if it errors, well, we, we remember the error, we, uh, and then we close the file, and then we return the error. So success or not. Um, so you probably won't write this in C, but this is, this is the guts of what you need to do. Um, so in ZFS, uh, we have two. Um, we have two things recording your changes. So we have the the DMU. This is the the data management unit. This is like, this is kind of ZFS's conception of like the traditional sort of page cache or buffer cache. Um, it's just like it just it gives you chunks of memory and you fill it with stuff and whatever's the latest version of that, we don't record the old version, but it was the latest version of that, that's what's getting written out to the disk. So it's just you're just updating memory. But then we also have a thing called the ZIL, the ZFS intent log, and this is a journal. In there we write, we record the operations we're taking to make those updates, okay? And so, um, so for example, in our program, you know, it's gonna call write, it's gonna write, you know, 1K of stuff, and that's gonna fill you know, be writing into the first part of the buffer. So that, that, that bit of that buffer is dirty. That, that whole buffer is dirty, but we've just modified the first part. Then we do another write, and, you know, we add some more, and we keep doing this. And so now, oh, we're into the second buffer now, okay? So we're just, we're, we're, we've got the latest state in those buffers in memory, but we're also keeping 
this log of what we did, okay? So that's sort of fine. Um, obviously, this is vastly simplified, but this is the, the sort of concept. So right now, you know, we finished writing our file. You know, let's say we didn't fill the last buffer. It doesn't matter. Um, it's just going to be zeros, whatever. Um, and this is all just in memory at this point. Um, so one of two things is going to happen. Um, if we don't call fsync, at some point in the future, I'm talking like fractions of a second, um, the transaction is going to close, which is, means it changes color to blue, the, the international color of closed. Um, and ZFS is going to start writing this out. And of course, ZFS is a uh, like a transactional file system, so it works really hard to do like atomic writes of all of the state in the transaction. So it writes that out, and it's like, well, that's on disk now, so we don't actually need this stuff. We don't need this alternate version, uh, so we kill it. We just drop it from memory. That's fine. But what we could have done instead is uh, call fsync. And fsync instead doesn't close the transaction. It just writes the log down, OK? And then the, so this transaction is still open. It can still accumulate more modifications. Um, and then at some point, it will close. And um, that will be written out. And we're in the same position. Um, so. There's kind of two different directions we can get there. And you might wonder, then, why do we bother with this? Um, when we call fsync, couldn't we just close? Oh, no, I'm on the right page. No, I am on the right page. Anyway, yes, you might wonder why we do this. Couldn't we just call fsync? Uh, when we call fsync, couldn't we just close the transaction and ship it out? And we could. That would do exactly what fsync says, which is ensure that the, the data is on disk. Um, that would totally work. But it's not what we want because, in practice, each transaction is going to have changes from lots of different files in it. Um, you can tell they're all different colors. <laughs> and if we, wrote, if we wrote all of that out every time you call fsync, you know, I just want to fsync uh, uh, purple, different purple, third purple. I didn't actually think about that. Um, it, it's kind of more blue on here, anyway. Um, but we're going to, you know, we just want to write that out. You're writing too much. That's going to be slow, um, particularly if that's very, very busy. But instead, if we've got all these different, if this is the, the, the ZIL, this is the journal, um, and, you know, what have we got there? We've got, you know, a bit of Austin, some pretend Latin. We've got a bit of a famous political speech from Australia. Uh, we've, uh, you know, got our, the transcript of our game of Zork. Um, uh, you know, news from uh, the Shire. Um, I forget what I put in there. But we've got all these things that we're writing out at the same time because everyone's uploading their files. And we only want to write out, uh, we've, we've just finished writing uh, our, the transcript of our Zork game. So, you know, file descriptor seven, Zork one, da 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 da. So we can call fsync on that, and we can only write down those bits of the log, which is the smallest amount we can write. And later, you know, the transaction will close and write the rest out and all of that will happen. So that's how we can ensure that the information we need is on disk, but still keep things as fast as possible. So yeah, so that's the overview. Change the recording two ways. What we changed, how we changed it. DMU buffers going to transaction, and they get written out atomically. Zill context can be written out by object on demand. Um, and the trigger for that is Fsync. So, Fsync in ZFS is really awesome. It's like this awesome. No, it's this awesome. And the reason, yeah, the reason it's awesome is um, because it can't fail ever. Maybe that's not so awesome, but it sounds really cool. And the reason it can't fail is. Okay, it looks like it could fail. This is the um, this is a simplified version of the syscall uh, 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 handler for the for the fsync syscall. And the reason that it looks like it should be able to fail, it returns int, it could return an error, but as you see, it calls zil commit and it doesn't check its return. And the reason it doesn't check its return is because there isn't one. It returns void. Um, so this thing succeeds uh, has to succeed, right? But this makes no sense because. Obviously, this does a lot of I.O. 
an IO can fail. So like, what? Um, and the truth of it is, the reason it doesn't, and um, I can see Alexander here kind of almost glaring at me because he knows how many hundreds of lines this <laughs> function actually is, but let's pretend. Um, it says, oh, well, I'll try and commit this stuff to the zill, but if that fails, I'll just go and wait for the transaction. Something somewhere else in the system will take care of it. I'll just wait for the transaction to close, I'll wait for it to be written out, and then I'll return. So one way or the other, I get my if sync. Maybe if the zill goes wrong, it's slow, but it's still like semantically correct. Um, and that's sort of the assumption that the zill makes. And that so yeah, f sync never fails, um, but it doesn't necessarily succeed. Um, it, and if the pool never comes back, it's going to wait a long time. So this kind of sucks. Um, you know, the pool's suspended, probably. Uh, if sync's blocked, the application is waiting. The user connection is waiting. There is a user, you know, maybe it's going to be a, an upload program or something, but they're, they're waiting. They're waiting for service right now. That application is, everyone's just waiting. And maybe that makes sense long ago when ZFS was young and you only had one computer. But of course, if you have mo you know, seen any modern distributed system, it could return an error. And then the application could take that and go, oh, I'll redirect you to another, another node, another shard, another something else, and we'll service the user that way. The computer's still broken, but the user still gets service, which would be much better. Um, so, I don't know if, you, if you've been in this position before, you may have poked around in ZFS and, and go online and at some point someone will mention the fail mode prop property. Um, and this tells, this instructs ZFS what to do if a pool suspends. By sus I mean, I'm assuming you know enough ZFS here to know that suspend basically means there are not enough devices available to uh, uh, service the pools, excuse me, service the pools redundancy. So like, uh, you know, you've lost, you, you've got a RAID Z2 and you lose three disks. So, you know, that sort of thing. Um, by default, it's wait. This is what we see. Just block. Just all stop until the pool comes back, if it comes back. There's an option called panic, which is panics the kernel. Um, this is, maybe this is fine if you just want to arrange for your machine to reboot or, you know, or, or say crash dump or whatever else you've got. Um, less good if you've got multiple pools that all might be working just fine, but, you know. Um, and there's this thing called continue, uh, and it's kind of weird. Uh, it will make new write ops return uh, an IO error immediately. Um, in flight, Sync ops, like if sync, uh, will block and will continue to block. Um, and reads kind of might work if, if they can be serviced from the cache, if there's enough disks to, um, to be able to read what we need. So people turn on thinking, oh, that feels like what I want. Um, and then it invariably is not. I don't entirely know its history. I sort of know it, and it was something to do with like uh, early versions of Linux with some block devices like you'd send I, uh, some kinds of IO and it wouldn't return. Like it wouldn't return failure, it wouldn't return success. And so I, there's a gap in my knowledge there. I don't quite know what, what this helped with, but it's like, it's kind of never what you want. So none of these are gonna help you in this situation, right? Um, so what, we gotta, we gotta fix this. Um, and you know, and we do because we were paid to, um, and that's the law. So, we write ourselves a spec and it's pretty simple. We say, okay, if the, if the pool suspends, if f sync is in progress, it should return error. So, but I've been using f sync as kind of a placeholder for a whole class of system calls. Um, so there's yeah, f sync this file, there's f data sync, which is f sync just the data portion, um, which is like if you, Effectively, you grow a file, you say f data sync, the data goes down, but we won't update like the directory entry, so we won't update the length of the, the you know, of the, the file size in the directory. It will update later when the rest is synced out, but it can be if you're constantly writing a file, um, 
it can sort of be faster. Um, in ZFS, they're the same thing. But um, then there's sync, which is sync all the that's the sync uh, command as well. You know, it just tells the kernel flush everything from all file systems. Um, Linux has a tighter variant of this, which is sync the file system that the open file that this file descriptor references lives on. So, um, which you get if you do sync-f, which is a thing I use a lot. Um, there's msync, which is if you've got an mmapped region and you make some changes to it and then you call msync, that will do the same kind of thing. Um, there's, if you open your file with osync or odsync, that is effectively do an fsync or an fdata sync after each write. Um, on Linux, there's pwrite v2, where you can say in set flags, individual operations get syncing behavior. Um, sync file range is just like hella weird um, and actually isn't helped here because it doesn't go through the, sorry, it doesn't go through the same sync machinery, so uh, whatever. Um, and then there's your asynchronous variants. Um, and then there's sync equals always. This is a uh, property you can set on your data set that forces ZFS to, do, to, to call zil commit after every change, um, every write operation, so, um, which is kind of chaotic, but you know, if your application demands it. So we to refine this slightly. Uh, any call blocked in zil commit should return an error appropriate for the syscall. All right. So, which is nice, at least we only need to fix it in one place. So we start off by just changing it so, well, it can return int instead of void. Um, and then we, you know, we change ZFS fsync to return that error. Um, there's more scope here, but there's a return error at the bottom. And of course, every other call site to make sure it does the right thing there. Um, and then we've just got to figure out what we put inside the owl, you know, what we put inside Zill commit. So uh, this is what we had. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is what we had, and what am I doing? All right, yeah, so TXG wait sync. This is our global wait for the transaction to complete. Um, and if we call, if we look inside that, we find, oh, there's actually two variants. Um, there is uh, just wait and assume that it succeeds. Verify is like assert that it, like it's panic. It's like if this doesn't return zero, panic. So like that is a strong assertion that uh, this will always succeed. And then there's a signal version. This is used for um, uh, in channel programs. Uh, channel programs are like you have to upload a little bit of Lua into ZFS and have it do pull operations like they're in the kernel. Um, and um, but obviously you want to be able to like control C that, so uh, the signaling version does that. But that actually kind of bodes well because that tells us, okay, these are actually interruptible. Uh, we don't, maybe don't have to wait forever. Um, this is real code, I'm not gonna go through this, but like basically there is a sync thread off to the side that's actually doing the work. So all this is saying is, while, uh, oh yeah, waiting for transaction. So while, I, while we're not up to that transaction yet, tell the sync thread, hey, could you synchronize some more for me, please? And then do the right kind of wait, either a signal wait, so I can be interrupted by completion or by a signal, or I can just be interrupted by completion and then return whether we were, whether we're returning because we were signaled or because we finished the transaction. So, you can imagine that, like, oh, yeah, we just need to build in a third option, right? Um, so that's as much as I'm going to show code because I actually spent a couple of hours, like, reading the sync code a couple of nights ago and thinking, like, okay, how do I present this? And I thought, it's, it's, in concept, it's straightforward. It's, like, find all the places that this could possibly go wrong and signal something. Uh, but there's a lot of touch points and um, they're kind of boring. Um, yeah, the pull suspends during I.O. We need something to signal back into that loop. Uh, hey, you need to, to break you, and you need to return. Um, and as it happens, um, this work's already been done. 
There is a pull request that's still open for something called forced export. The idea is, like, if the pool suspends, normally you can't export it because exporting a pool requires writing to the pool. Uh, we have to, you know, finalise a bunch of data structures, we have to write them, that sort of thing. So you try to export your failed pool and it doesn't work. So this PR, you know, it, it's got an old date on it, but it's one that um, the team at Clara, we come back to it every now and again and, and sort of keep it moving along. Um, it has that, it, it, it does that, it does that, it does forced export, it's very nice. But one of the things that it has in it in order to do that, it's already done all the work. It changes, it changes that uh, should I break for signals or not into a set of flags. The thing, which things should we wait for? Um, or sorry, which things are allowed to interrupt this interrupt for transactions? So signal is what it was before. We can also say, um, Maybe it's kind of weird that it's called no suspend. Maybe it should be called suspend. But anyway, um, if the if the pool wait, but if the pool suspends, return and tell us. And then there's wait, but if the operator said force force this to export, they'd return the thing. We don't need the forced export one, but but this construction is really useful. Um, so with that in hand, we can turn our fallback into something more like this. Uh, we say, yeah, wait, wait, synced. But if it suspends, get us out of here. And then we check if it's suspended by looking for E again. And if it did, we say, okay, well, we're going to return an IO error and return it from Zill commit and return it from F sync. And there we go. Um, and that's great. Um, yeah. So if you know if you know anything about Zill, you know I'm being extremely economical with the truth here. Um, I pretty much wrote this bit for you, Alexander, <laughs> because there are actually about four or five different places where it will just throw up its hands, just go, you know what, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to wait for the transaction sync. I'm not talking about that here. I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, if someone wants to know, I looked at it and I thought, this is very inside baseball. Uh, there's, there's, the theory is the same. You just look at those calls and ask the question, what if they failed? and then do the appropriate thing to make that work. It gets to some really interesting places, but you know, we get that going and we're good. So it's all very well to unstick this, to make it so we can now return errors from FSIG, but we also have to consider what will applications do? Because up until now, any applications doing this, they've been content to wait. They're gonna suddenly start getting an error um, and are they going to behave? Because we don't want to make the situation worse. It might have actually been okay if they were just stopped and didn't take any further progress. But if they're not checking for f -sync's error, they may think that, oh, everything's fine and I can continue. And they continue and they get themselves into a worse situation. So we sort of need to find out, well, what is their expectation? Um, is this safe to do? And I'm going to do a quiz now. Um, and this is more fun if you do know the horrible truth about f -sync to pretend you were in a simpler time of your life where you didn't. Um, so who knows what, does anyone know what, they sh what their program should do if F-Sync returns a failure? You can call out if you want or not. There you go. Do something, yeah, let someone else handle it. Try again. Try again. Yeah. Which one? Yeah, yeah panic. Cool, that's literally my list. <laughs> um, and if you do ignore it, and then you do another write, and that write succeeds, what does that mean? And if you call fsync again, and that succeeds, what does that mean? It should mean all the writes will fail. But there's no key all the writes will fail. That's not Depends what operating system you're using. I told you. <laughs> Yeah, but, but yes, it should mean that. You'd think it would mean that. Um, but there was a time when we all found out that that's not how it works. Uh, has anyone heard of F-Sync gate? Because everyone loves a gate. Um, so this was sort of a, obviously, yeah, obviously tongue in cheek. Oh, I'll keep going, all right. <laughs> so this is there's so much technology here, it's great. But um, so back in 2018, uh, so the PostgreSQL developers sort of made a very strange discovery um, 
that what had happened was um, they'd seen in a client, in a customer system they'd seen a data corruption um, after they'd taken a successful checkpoint. So. Uh, and this led to quite a few discussions within Postgres, within sort of uh, some of the Linux community and sort of the broader, you know, people interested in storage kind of community. And um, which kind of surprised even quite a lot of veterans of the, the industry. And it went like this. Postgres does async writes. So um, it, it doesn't call fsync after each write. It's, uh, you know, it relies on like the, the uh, you know, the buffer cache or the, the, you know, the DMU if it was ZFS. Um, so in the background, the kernel begins flushing pages. Um, some writes fail because, you know, the disks die or whatever. So the kernel um, will typically, well, in the Linux's case, the kernel sets a failed flag on those pages. But of course, it has, this is asynchronous. This is in the background. It has no way to inform the application. So, you know, life goes on. Postgres begins writing a checkpoint. A checkpoint is like a snapshot in Postgres. It's like this is a, this is a rollback point. Um, and at the end of its checkpoint, it writes fsync. And it, uh, it calls fsync. And it calls fsync there, assuming that that's going to push out everything that's come before. So you know, it's a, that's the synchronization point. Um, the kernel returns uh, an IO error because there are failed pages. Um, there are pages with a failed flag, so it, that's it. It's like this is my chance. I, now I can inform the application of what's going on. Um, now in Linux, and I'll get into platform differences in a minute, but in Linux that clears the failed flag, so it says this is no longer failed. It also clears the dirty flag. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But this is what happens in Linux. So you now have a clean page sitting in the page cache with no error state, and anyone who asks believes that it is on disk. Postgres got an I.O. error, so it aborts the checkpoint. Um, more writes come in, more changes, just normal operation. Sometime, you know, they say, you know, sometime later, it begins a new checkpoint. It calls fsync. Fsync now succeeds because um, it was able to flush out those more recently, you know, anything marked dirty, which is not the original ones, um, and they all worked, so there's no fail pages, so it returns success. And Postgres is like, great. Um, yeah, great, that stuff's on disk. Um, everything in the past is on disk. We're good to go, except though the original set of pages were not marked dirty, they didn't get written down. So then afterwards, uh, you know, a recovery operation happens uh, or even just a, uh, you know, a restart and uh, the database is corrupted. And this was surprising. And this led to people really trying to understand how F-Sync works or what it does. So, Obviously, we can appeal to, you know, to POSIX, which doesn't say a lot. Uh, FSync permission shall request that all data from the open file descriptor named by file is to be transferred to the storage device associated with the file described by file. The nature of the transfer is implementation dependent, implementation defined. And it won't return until the system's completed that action or until an error is detected. Of course, that action being implementation defined, so you could define the action as a... Uh, uh, a thing that doesn't work or whatever. Um, that's, that's the entire description. Um, there is some stuff in the return path, in the return documentation. If it fails, outstanding IO operations are not guaranteed to have been completed. Um, and EIO just means an IO error occurred. So it doesn't say anything about what happens after an error. And there is a bit more explanatory information in um, you know, like if, if, if you actually read the description of it, the sort of non-normative stuff. But the main reason it's like this is because POSIX, a, a compliant implementation of the POSIX APIs don't necessarily have to have a buffer cache, don't necessarily have to have non-volatile non storage. Um, uh, those concepts don't exist. So there's no real way to write down what this should do. Um, which is fine, that just means we can't, <laughs> it just means anyone who says, well, POSIX says FSync should do this, is wrong, but that's not useful. So most systems with a, you know, a Unix heritage or, or clones, a clone in particular, um, this all comes down to how page cache flags are modified. 
um, by IO. So there's sort of three flags. These are three real flags in most BSD-based systems, but they're at least conceptual in others. Um, there is a dirty flag. This page has changes and needs to be written out. Um, there is an error flag. The last time I tried to flush this out, uh, it failed. Um, and there is an, in, an invalid flag, which is this page is not usable, it's waiting to be freed. So it doesn't, it doesn't exist, it can't be used, it's just sitting around because a reclaim process hasn't happened yet. Um, so different operating systems do different things here. Um, FreeBSD before version four, and so I, based on, I, I should say, I did this survey a year ago, so some things may have updated since then, but also I didn't look super, super hard because I was just trying to get a sense of is there any uniformity to this? Um, and the answer is no. But uh, sort of prehistoric BSDs and beyond, um, if the flush fails, they'll set the error flag, they'll leave the dirty flag set. This is kind of what you expect, right? Um, that means that if sync will return an IO error because the error flag is set, but it'll try again next time, and, and um, that's not quite true. It won't try again next time. If sync will set the invalid flag, so it will just say, okay, well, I tried, this page is done for, the end. I reported an error, whatever. Um, so you can't use that page anymore. If we won't try and flush it again, we will eventually reclaim it. Um, in FreeBSD 4, which is 90, this commit was 1999, um, this changed. Uh, again, we set the error flag, we leave the dirty flag set. Um, FSync now clears error, but leaves dirty set, which means that the next time the sort of asynchronous flush process comes through, it will try to write it again, may succeed, may fail. FSync will report on what happened next time, okay? This is good. You will never lose that page, and it will do kind of what we intuitively expect. If sync will, when if sync returns success, that stuff is definitely on disk. The problem is, if the disk never comes back, that page can never be reclaimed. It's always it's going to hang around in memory forever because it's going to be marked dirty forever. Um, so FreeBSD, sorry, on. What else did you expect? Throws it away. Maybe. I mean, that, yeah, that, I mean, that's where I'm going, and that's, that's, uh, that's the question. And FreeBSD 12 tried to split the disk, tries to split the difference. So this is what's in FreeBSD 12, which is, it sets invalid if the physical device is gone. So not it returned an error, but it actually went away. And this is what you want for like a USB stick, for, for a permanent device failure. If the device is coming back, you want, um, you probably want to hang around. If the device is never coming back, then you might as well throw it away. Now, of course, we don't know that. We can't see the future. But removable device, not removable device is probably a reasonable kind of thing. Like if you pull out a USB stick in the middle of, you know, or a floppy drive, uh, a floppy disk, in the middle of a, a write, it's like you have a reasonable expectation that things aren't great. And so, yeah. But so that's not too bad. It's sort of making the best of a bad situation, perhaps. Linux, when the flush fails, as we said, it sets the error flag, but it clears the dirty flag. So <laughs> this, is, this is weird. When you call fsync, it clears the error flag. It also does not invalidate anything. So that is the weird situation where you now have a clean live page in the page cache, if you try to read from it, you will get what you wrote there because, you know, it's a live page. But if that page then got evicted and then you read it back, it would be different because what's on disk is different. Um, and what this means is that if you call, and this is what, lead, what Postgres people found out, if you call fsync and it returns error and then you call fsync again, it returns success because there's no new errors since the last time you checked. And it's kind of a philosophical argument <laughs> and uh, interpretive argument. Like this isn't, this appears deliberate in Linux. Um, 
it goes back to like the mid 90s um, and it was definitely the change came in around the time that like uh, better removable device support was trying to be added. It's kind of weird. Anyway, um, Dragonfly BSD was does the free BSD uh, 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 does this one the the retry forever thing. It was forked after FreeBSD four, I believe. So um, that kind of makes sense. NetBSD, on the other hand, it was before the um, before that change in FreeBSD. Um, this code doesn't change a lot. So um, so yeah, so it will you get you get one shot and then. You toast. Um, OpenBSD does the one-shot business, um, but it also marks the vNode damaged, which uh, the vNode is, you know, you have multiple file descriptors on open file, but you have one vNode. Um, so it marks the vNode damaged, so any, um, all future calls to fsync against that vNode automatically get IO error until the vNode is released, until, the, so, uh, until all the file descriptors are closed, which is like, that's not bad. So that ensures that whatever happens, it's always saying, I don't know. I don't know if I can put everything on disk. You need to start over. Um, MacOS, I don't know what MacOS is called. It does do the, the, you know, the old uh, BSD thing of uh, sitting invalid, but also it's Apple, so there may be other things in there. Um, and fine, you know, the code I can see appears to do that. Um, it's kind of cool that they're all based off the same code because it means I could search for like uh, just the same thing. It's in the uh, uh, B, B RELS, the, the block release function, if you want to go spell anything. Um, and Illumos kind of tries and tries again, but doesn't try forever. Uh, clears the flag, uh, leaves dirty set, so we'll retry. Um, then if the flush fails a second time, it puts it on, on the free list, so it says, we're going to reclaim this, but before we do the reclaim, we're going to try one more time to write it out. I don't, the code is kind of gnarly, and, and at that point, I was really tired, so I was like, okay, fine. I got to where I wanted it, so basically, there isn't a lot of uniformity in this. You can't really, as an application writer, you can't really assume everything, anything after everything fails. Um, which means as to what do applications actually do, and again, I wanted to find out, well, if I just foist this thing on people, what, what's going to happen? Um, so I looked at a few applications I was interested in. Uh, Postgres, uh, as kind of the patient zero, they switch to panicking on fsync failure. So they, they will panic the database, that will initiate their data recovery process. Um, you know, so like roll back to the last checkpoint and then try to replay the log and whatever else. Um, uh, MySQL, so InnoDB started doing the same thing not long after. Everyone points back to Postgres and basically says, you know, whoa, this thing, we should do that. Um, that's not limited to like, you know, the, the, the most common, I think MongoDB at least does the same thing. MongoDB is kind of a weird example to have in here maybe, except I have a good friend who works for Mongo um, and so, Every time I said, oh, wow, I just discovered this thing. He's like, huh. And he'd go and talk to the server team, and they're like, yeah, it does it this way. I'm like, oh, cool. So um, to me, this seems like the best response for a database. It's basically a file system. It knows where its data is. It has a recovery strategy. Um, it can use it. You know, it gets better control over its own destiny a little bit. Um, applications that just assume success, SQLite. It's terrified me. Um, it does actually bubble the fsync error code up to, to its, it has a lot of different storage modules in the back, and it has a lot of different kind of front end modules. You know, there is the SQL one, but there's some other ones. Um, it does give the sync error back up to the top, but most of them ignore it. Um, and they actually say in their documentation, um, we assume that the operating system will do the right thing here. Um, maybe that makes sense. So I kind of hope I'm wrong about that. It's, again, it's a lot of code. Maybe that makes sense. If for a library, maybe you want to leave it to, uh, you know, the application that's embedding it to, to take care of that. The least that I could find, like Chrome and Firefox did not, um, and they were kind of my obvious uh, big users of SQLite, so I didn't look further. Um, Zapien, Zapien is a search engine, uh, like, like a text search engine, which is basically a database for, uh, an embeddable database for, uh, um, uh, term to document ID maps, so you can 
search things. Um, it does call fsync. It only sometimes checks the error code, and sometimes it does nothing. Um, so it seems like you can reasonably assume that after an fsync failure, your, um, your search index may very well be stuffed, um, which is cool. Some of this comes out of like software that I know from previous sysadmin work. Um, things that will attempt to recover. Uh, Redis, if you're using it with its journal, uh, its append-only log, uh, it will, if it's in fsync mode, which is not the default, uh, it will panic if the fsync fails. Um, in the default journal mode, or with no default, it will aggressively fsync, like in a loop until the fsync succeeds, which as we know on Linux will on the second call. So um, it's an effective ignore, I don't know. Uh, Cyrus mail server, again, showing you more and more of my, my history. Um, it uses a journal key value store for its metadata. Um, um, and it uses fsync very carefully to um, do, essentially do like a three-phase commit of everything, uh, trying to handle the case where a di disk fails. So it like sets a dirty flag, fsync, writes fsync, sets the flag clean, and fsync. Um, in its worst case, an fsync failure will trigger its recovery code. And in its worst case, its recovery word, recovery code will abandon the old database, create a new one, and try to copy everything that's good into it. So you're going to copy a whole bunch of corruption. So, uh, unamazing. Um, but most casual use of fsync that I could find, apart from that, um, people just shove it into their, their regular IO error path. Um, and that's usually going to mean that if it fails, probably the last write is indeterminate. So the good thing for us means that uh, we can do whatever we want because there's no, there's no real uniformity. Um, and I sort of sound blase about that, but like, like if, if it had been clear that, because you've got to remember, like, X4 and UFS and all these things, uh, they use the operating system facilities. Um, so they will do what I said the operating system does. So applications already don't have a particular expectation of anything working well um, <laughs> in, in this case. Like they're probably already losing data. So I didn't need to worry too much. Um, so the real question was like, which kind do we do? Do we keep the, do we keep the data around, keep it dirty? Um, and retry it next time? Um, or do we invalidate it and free it? Um, or phrase another way, is a failure transient or permanent? Um, transient means, yeah, the pool's gonna come back soon. Permanent means the pool's probably never gonna come back. And the decision we made was uh, transient because, um, you know, serious ZFS pools are big, they're managed, you've planned them, it probably is coming back. You're probably monitoring it, you're probably fixing it, you're probably doing something. Um, so it would be better for us to just hold on to that data. We're not gonna block fsync, but at least hold on to that in memory until it comes back. So that's what we did. Um, and we're kind of nearing the end now. Um, where it's at right now is it works. Um, we've implemented this for a customer. They have it deployed. Um, and uh, yeah, it works. When the pull suspend, um, if sync gets an error, their application redirects, uh, redirects use traffic to another shard. So they got what they wanted. Um, it needs to be forward ported. It was done against 2.1.5. It is a lot of changes to the Zill, um, which I haven't got around to forward porting yet. Um, forced export needs to be finished and merged, or, or at least like 80% of it needs to be the, the, done. The, the, the stuff that changes whether the low-level weight function can return an error, basically everyone in the system who calls it needs to be prepared for something like that. So even if, even if we didn't merge the front end that actually lets you force the pool to export, um, we still need like all the machinery there. Um, and probably we're gonna add a new fail mode to uh, to enable this, um, we have been doing it with fail mode continue um, on the idea that like that's kind of what you expect it to do when you sort of naively use it. But um, it's pro in the interest of sort of backward compatibility, it's probably better just to 
do a new one. So to say when the pool suspends, um, error, 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 everything, and then obviously a lot of testing, um, which is probably going to mean quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of new tests for the Zill, um, which would be nice anyway. It has lots, but it's kind of cool. I hope to get this landed by the end of the year. That may be ambitious. I wrote that last night. I went, yeah, how do I feel about that? It's like, maybe. Um, at least some of the pieces of it. Um, and this, I confess, I forgot most of the ideas we'd had on this. One I did think of, though, if you've used, um, if you've used uh, ext4 and it has an option called um, errors equals remount ro, which is basically if yeah if there is some kind of uh, some kind of failure, just make the file system read only. So we'll write operations, return um, yeah return erofs rather than eio. That may be a good in between option if you don't want this kind of failure to you know like to invoke your applications like recovery thing. You know like Postgres will panic and go into recovery. Maybe it might do something a little softer if we can still try to make reads work. Um, that would be a small, I mean, literally, when this happens, return this or return this, so it's very small. Um, and that is all I have. So that's if sync. That's been my life for a year or so and maybe a year or so more. Um, and that's all I've got. Thank you. But we've got, we've got time left, so... Um, if you wanted to ask me something, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. Did you kind of the semantics of a query topic by experiment or by code inspection? The question was, how did I, because for the, the mic, the question was, uh, did I confirm the behavior in operating systems by, uh, by experiment or by code read and uh, mostly by code read on all those other once, yeah, just reading code. I have, I do have some, there are some test programs out there. The PostgreSQL people wrote a couple to confirm the behavior. Um, but it's, it can be kind of difficult to actually crash disks in the right way to evoke this. So, um, and I wasn't trying to confirm the behavior as such, more establish that there was enough variance that I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to worry too much about conforming to any like secret Unknown knowledge. Do you um, do you have any preference on any particular uh, system for uh, for checking how this, how this works out? Yeah. So this was all. So where this came from, this came out of a, a larger unit of work um, where a this customer was uh, they had uh, fourteen wide. RAID Z three pools and um, the backplane would fail and take out multiple disks at a time, so the pools were kind of suspending intermittently and then they'd reset the backplane and it would kind of come back. And um, so we started off by, they, they lent us some test equipment and we started off by writing a set of uh, tests that would basically run a whole bunch of, you know, run a lot of writes mimicking their, their write patterns with their syncs and everything else and then power off like five disks. Um, and then like, uh, uh, you know, bring them back up and see what happened, or like cold uh, power cycle the machine at that point before the pool came back so that it would never get a chance to flush anything out later and then analyze what was on disk against what we really did. Um, so we've confirmed it that way. We've now reduced that to um, something that can run in the test suite using um, some like virtual devices and, and things like that. Um, Sorry, I didn't actually repeat the question there, did I? Because <laughs> I just realized I forgot the question. Um, did you have any test rig for it? Yeah, yeah. Did we, did we have a test rig for it? So, yes, that was, that was how, that was the, the, the testing we were doing to, to establish it and, and feel good about that we fixed it. Um, it uh, it's probably going to need more comprehensive testing, um, which I'm not, off the top of my head, I'm not entirely sure what that looks like, but. Um, once you sort of have seen the code path through it, it's like it's like oh yeah, this is conceptually straightforward. So it's it's kind of a nice set of changes in that respect. Um, yeah. You're looking at the change from the historical 
uh, to mark invalid and to mark dirty. Uh, did you find any discussion uh, about justification for, for the new approach? Yeah, the uh, the question was looking back through the history. Did I find any justification for those uh, changes? Um, there's not a lot. Commit messages are fairly sparse through that. The change from the change in FreeBSD four from uh, uh, invalid to dirty. The commit message is all right there, and it basically says it is. Um, it seems on balance that we are better to keep the, keep this data hanging around rather than blow away the other copy of it. Um, and that's about it. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's fair. Because um, implied in that is like, I don't know what we're supposed to do, but uh, keeping the data is better than nuking the data. And then, yeah, and then the one in FreeBSD 12 that splits it uh, based on removable or not, uh, that does say, um, yeah, it, it seems better that USB devices are uh, not coming back. Um, but there's most of the other systems like are just using the original code so they don't actually say anything because they've never made a change there. Um, and then a lot of, like once you get into like Alumos or, or Macos, there's like basically no comments about anything. So um, yeah, the Linux side is, the Linux side is kind of tough. Uh, the reason they did it that way originally is not really mentioned anywhere. Like I couldn't find it on any mailing lists, uh, I couldn't find it in the code. Um, when this all went down in uh, that the the first release that kind of had fixes for this was kernel 4.13, um, and in that they implemented like a a common error reporting uh, framework inside the kernel for all file systems to uh, like report I/O errors into, and then if sync for all of those will respond based on that state in that error reporting system. So in there, it was it's very clear that like we are doubling down on this behavior and we are building an entire edifice to support its use. Um, so based on that, it's like either it was deliberate in the beginning and that's just not recorded or it was not deliberate, but they chose to retain the behavior. Um, there's probably, probably someone I can ask you. There's, there's an entertaining anecdote that's not Unix based. In the DDoS, if you pull the floppy while it was writing, you would get a GUI prompt saying, you must reinsert this. Yeah. Um, do you remember what the, the comment was just in Amiga DOS? Uh, if you pull the disk out in the middle of the write, it would um, you know, aggressively tell you, you must reinsert the disk. But do you know why that was? <laughs> there is a, there is a, um, there's a function there called get device proc. Um, and it's literally a loop. It's like, I will sit here forever trying to reaccess this device. And at the bottom of that, because you know, DOS can access the UI, it would just throw up, it would call error report. And error report would throw up that thing. And that loop just ran forever. So um, yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, I'm not sure if it's really reasonable to expect that you had any data integrity guarantee on on Amiga DOS, but anyway, um, it's good fun. Cool, grab me outside if you want to talk a bit more about it later. Thank you.